Uh, welcome back. Uh, very good morning, everyone. So now uh, it's, it's very it, it's a holiday time, and thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for uh, continuing our 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 session. And before we start our class, uh, shall we start uh, to paying respect to Triple J? Everything go wonderful. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputassa. So welcome back again. So last class, uh, we discussed about uh, the, 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 the division of Sangha and uh, the Buddha's uh, Mahaparinirvana, the demise of, sang, uh, the demise of the Buddha. And after his passing away, what's happened, the political climax and the division of Sangha. And we discussed up to second Buddhist council. So for your uh, reference, so maybe we can discuss a little bit, uh, we can go to that little bit of review. So, okay, give my slide. Just a moment, okay, I got it. Okay, so uh, as you know that uh, the time frame, uh, so maybe it, it is it, it can be help us a little, a little bit about the about the, the 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 to understand the development of the 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 Buddhist history. So as we know that uh, the Buddha he was a sixth century BCE. So that means from now that uh, two thousand six hundred years ago. So that the time frame was not same. Uh, so then after his passed away, um, the Sangha was divided and uh, some, some, some monks was uh, claiming that uh, the Buddha was not no more, so we can do whatever we like to do. But having seen this conflict, some elder Sangha, uh, such as Venerable Mahakashapa or Mahakashapiya, he noticed and he, told, he thought that, okay, after and Buddha's passed away that I mean that the, the teaching will be disappeared. So we need to find out some way to preserve the, all the teachings. So then uh, three months uh, after the Buddha's uh, passing, he called a conference or council where uh, a group of monks attended and it was mentioned that uh, most of monks, all of them are Arahat or Latin monks. So in this council um, that uh, we came to know that the output of this council, uh, Dharma and Vinaya was, uh, were recorded. So as we discussed the Dharma and uh, as about a Sutra and also all the Pitaka text, like uh, Dirga Nikaya, Sanyutta Nikaya, Majjhima Nikaya, Angutta Nikaya and Kuddhaka Nikaya, all the, all the Pitaka text were preserved, but it was preserved in not written way. It was preserved in uh, oral transmission. So as we discussed that it was a very hard job to transmit oral and it was happened until uh, Thar Buddhist Council. So that means that for, from the Buddha's passed away to until the, the period of King Ashoka, the 300 years, this, this period, all the teachings were preserved in oral and a verbal, verbal way. So monks has done a very good job and it was a, it was a very hard job because someone need to be preserved this, uh, someone need to memorize the text, the whole text. So, and he had a, those who memorize the text, he has a duty to transmit into his disciple and make sure before he passed away, his disciple memorized the text or the sutra. So, and uh, in a hundred years later, and another council was uh, held, it, which is known as uh, Second Buddhist Council. And in the Second Buddhist Council, it was very historical council. And it was uh, because of the Sangha, the monks, they have uh, some conflict. And uh, they did, they, some monks did not follow the Binaya accordingly. So therefore, it was so important to arrange that conference. So having seen this uh, unlawful action by monks, so elder monks, uh, they discussed that, okay, we need to call the council say, similar to the first Buddhist council. So then the uh, second Buddhist council was called in Boishali. And after second Buddhist council, the Sangha was uh, mostly that uh, 
I mean, sang, Sangha was divided again. But from the Buddha's time, early Buddhist period to until the Second Buddhist Council, we can tell this is the time for non sectarian period. But the teaching was not uh, split it into many different groups. But after Second Buddhist Council, it started to become more splitting. And uh, Sangha divided into two main groups, which is, uh, which is known as the uh, Stavidavada and Mahasangika. I think this name is probably a bit uh, complicated for you. I, let me, I, I'm trying to speak in, uh, in the simple language. Stavidavada, uh, it, it means uh, like uh, the monks who follow, the elder monks actually. So uh, Stavidavada, they agree with the second Buddhist council. And some monks, they did not agree the decision of the second Buddhist council. So though they went away from, from Vaishali, uh, North India, and they moved to South, and sometimes they moved to uh, Kashmir, Mathura, and Gandhara state. Gandhara, the Gandhara as you, for your information, Gandhara is a present day Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, those sites, uh, Bactria, uh, some, some part in Kashmir. And uh, by, this, by this route, I mean, later on, we are, we are, we, we categorized as Silk Road, actually. But anyway, so after Second Buddhist Council, the, the Sangha was uh, divided into two main groups. But later on, these two groups became more, more groups. So according to some scholars, and most of the scholars, they agreed that Sangha probably divided into 18 schools. Uh, but it can be more. So, and also another Chinese account, it mentioned there may be more than 50 groups. But we, we exactly know that uh, from the Indian accounts and uh, some Sanskrit accounts, we know that uh, Sangha was divided into 18 main groups. So now we are discuss, uh, we, are, we, are, we are heading to the third Buddhist council, but we now see that after second Buddhist council, Sangha was divided into two main school. And one is the Stavdavada and Mahasangika. So until, uh, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, repeating, from the early Buddhist period, Buddha's time, historical Buddha's time, to until second Buddhist council, we can categorize the period as a early Buddhism or early Buddhist period. And there was a non-sectarian period. But after second Buddhist council, Sangha started to split and they moved to you know, different directions. So uh, after second Buddhist council, so until the third Buddhist council, the time frame about, uh, it was the, the, the gap we can see 140 years, something like this. So during this period, Sangha, you know, the group, the, again, the make chaos. And uh, in the third Buddhist council, it was uh, held during the time of Emperor Ashoka. So at the time it was, uh, in the, the, about the political political situation also not so stable in India, and some the Buddhist monks they moved here and there and many places. So sometimes they did not uh, they did not act the discipline in proper way. Therefore, the, some elder monks who who follow the vinaya or discipline monastic rules in proper way they did not agree with that monks. And uh, for the information, monks has a such certain of, certain of the some way to observe their binaya and discipline. So every full moon, full moon day, and also half moon day, so every per month twice, monk recited the their binaya rules and nuns too. So for monk, monks, they have a two hundred twenty seven rules, and for nun is about. Uh, 431, if I'm not wrong, but none have a bhikkhuni, have more rules than monk. Uh, so it has a reason actually why it's not same, but it's it, it, it regarding to their uh, practice. However, that uh, every full moon and half moon, monks and nuns, that is, uh, they are reciting discipline in their monastery or wherever they're reciting their practice. So some elder monks, 
they observed that a few monks in the Pataliputra or Northern India, they're not practicing the discipline very well. So they disagree to recite Binaya rules with them. And which is known as in Pali and Sanskrit, Upasata Karma or Upasata or reciting the Binaya rules or reciting the uh, discipline, monastic discipline. So they observed that some monks, since they, can, they don't follow the Binaya very well, so they disagree to recite the Binaya with them. And those, those monks are known as heretic monks. And the numbers of heretic monks, not so, not so normal. They are, they are quite num they are quite about 60,000 heretic monks. And also that uh, more than 60,000, um, 60,000 uh, true monks, and you know, so there was a lot of monks in, during that period. And another reason to arising the false monk because Emperor Ashoka, after he converted into Buddhism, he started to support warm-heartedly to all the Sangha, all the monks and Brahmin too. So he, he, he has a he has a he had a vow to help monks, people and uh, also that uh, he was a very religious religious uh, king so ashoka helped the monks uh, without any condition and having seen this kind of meritorious action some people some cunning people they enter into sangha and they're acting like a false monk but they have their own lifestyle but they also come to joining in the monastery because of their, because of obtaining some support from kings and uh, you know some, some uh, from, from the people as well, so normally uh, according to the Indian history and uh, in every uh, and the human civilization, it is very normal. Like when the king or emperor or ruler follow the particular religion or particular practice, people also follow the same same same, same religion and same belief as well. So in the Indian history, we can see that most of the king, they follow the, whatever, they, whatever, whatever religion they follow, people started to follow the same way. Like, like Emperor Ashoka became converted into Buddhism and people also became more faithful to Dharma as well. So similar to Emperor Ashoka, all the people and the wealthy people, they're supporting to the Sangha. So because of the because of the obtaining the support from Sangha, a lot of fake monk acting as a true monk. So Sangha became polluted. And some true monk, some good monk, they observed this, this incident. So they refused to practice Binaya Karma with the false monk. So they informed this incident to the Emperor Ashoka. And Emperor Ashoka agreed that, okay, you can do, uh, call the elder monks, you can arrange a council. Oh, I'm happy to support this council. So then, uh, then uh, they, because, before they arrange a council, the, the, all the monks, uh, they, need to be, they need to be identified. Who can be the right monk to attend this council? And who is the wrong monk or false monk? So to, uh, to, to identify the distinguish the, between the right and the, and the true monk and false monk. So elder monk Magaliputta Tisha, Magaliputta Tisha, he was the, he was, he became the chairperson for the, for, for the, for, for the third Buddhist council. So he has a trick. So he tricked that, okay, we have to ask some question to the monk. If the monk can answer proper way, we can say that they are, they are considered as a true monk. If they cannot answer the proper way, they are considered as a false monk. So the question was that, what did Buddha advocate? Or what is the nature uh, of the Buddha's, uh, I mean, how the Buddha, Buddha's teaching was propagated and how the Buddha encountered the question by others. So in, in Pali, we say the Kimbari Samma Sambuddha. But what did Buddha advocate it? So most of monks uh, answered Buddha was advocate 
of the doctrine of analysis. If the answer this way, the Vivajjavada, in, in Pali we say, a Sanskrit say Vivajjavada too, the all, almost same, same way they say. If monks say Buddha was advocate of the doctrine of analysis, they are considered as a true monk. Those who could not answer proper way, they are considered as a false monk and in Sanskrit and Pali we say Titiya, that means heretic monks or heretic Sangha. So they expel from the mainstream Sangha too. So now it is uh, actually there's a big big question about the what is Vivajavada sometime? Is it the, exactly the correct answer or not? And how can how can I mean when, when, when the, we can ask the question to others like what did Buddha advocate? We can answer many ways. Maybe we can answer that Buddha advocate four noble truths, eight full noble path or four foundation of mindfulness, dependent origination, something like this. But maybe there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of context behind, uh, behind this question. We came to know this information from, from the fifth centuries, one text uh, written by, uh, compiled by Penalbal Buddha Gosa, Dirganikaya Commentary, Samantha Pasatika. And also we can, we know, we know this information from Mahavansa as well. Mahavansa is a clonical Pali, Pali text. Mostly so it was written in the, yeah, it's a between the fourth to fifth century this, this in that period. So we can see the, the term Vivajjavada in the main stream Sutranta as well, but not very, not, not many ways. So here I'm, I would like to explain to you uh, the term Vivajjavada used in Subha Sutra, and they have a, in, in this sutra, Buddha said that Buddha is a Vivajjavada, and his logic was like, when the, when the one of the scholar monk, a, sco a scholar, uh, his name was Subhadra, he asked a question to the Buddha about the, what did you advocate? And Buddha re replied in his respect, uh, the one who would make a prominent uh, pro pronouncement only after having carried out of an analysis. The Buddha said he was he was preaching the teaching about uh, like a like the way of the doctrine of analysis, the Vivajjavada. And I have to he his way of encountering question by analysis and analytical ways. So in this, in this sutra, we can see that Buddha mentioned, I had four ways to encounter students or followers. So when some people ask question to the Buddha, he could not, he could, some answer, he, he, ans he, he replied straightforward with providing some simile. So, um, and some questions, he did not he did not provide straightforward way and uh, some answer he provide in you know providing some simile so buddha has four methods how how he delivered the, his dharma so some question when he he it doesn't need to provide more simile or more example he just say a straightforward and he answer like a like for example, what is the four noble truths? He answered the four noble truths is the, the truth, uh, the suffering, of suffering, the truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the, the cessation of suffering, the path to that cessation of suffering. And some question he cannot answer direct way. He needs to provide some defining and redefining and more simile as well. So, for example, if you if if some if someone asks about the rebirth from the Buddha. Buddha always providing the some story, and which we can see the in Kuddha Nikaya, Jataka story, the past life of the Buddha. And some question Buddha never answered. He he encountered with the question. For example, some uh, in the sutra we can see that uh, what is the middle way? Buddha never answered the things. Middle, Buddha said the middle way it can be the is neither extreme nor non-extreme. And when he, ans he was answering this question, he also encountered some way like what is extreme or what is non-extreme? And what happened? 
when he followed the extreme way and what happened when he did, did, did not follow the extreme practice or austere practice. So he encountered the question somewhere, sometime. And some question, the Buddha did not reply, replied, he became silent, such as that um, some, someone said that the origin of the universe, for example, some monks, they asked, who created the world? Buddha did not answer. And he said that he's such a, like a noble silence. And some scholar translated that Buddha said, I don't know. But in this term, Buddha was uh, silent that he did not answer the question that who created the universe or how to destruction of the universe. He said, it is just such, such a wasting the time, but we have to, you know, the, and Buddha always novel, uh, he was, he became a noble silence or he said answer no, or he did quiet about that. So Bivajavada, so Bivajavada, we can, we can understand that the, the Buddha's analysis way, the way, the way he analyzed the questions, the way he analyzed the teachings, the way he analyzed the Dharma as well. So those monks who agree with the, with the, with the, with, who, who provided the answer, what did the Buddha advocate? If the monks provided the answer, the Buddha advocate the doctrine of analysis they are considered as the true monk. So they, are, they got access to, to remain in Pataliputra. And among those monks, Venerable Maggaliputta Tisha, he selected 1,000 monks to attend into the first Buddhist council, sorry, third Buddhist council. So in the third Buddhist council, it was a historical council as well, and in this time, we can see that for the first time, the, all the teachings were recorded. And written tradition evolved in ancient India. So Third Buddhist Council, uh, there's uh, some difference between the first two council and Third Buddhist Council. In the first two council, we never see the term uh, Abhidharma. In the first two council, we say that we see that Dharma and Vinaya were collected. But from third Buddhist council, we see Dharma, Vinaya, and Abhidharma were collected by the, were, were compiled. And uh, it was, uh, we can see, we, we can see the reference from same Mahabansa, Sri Sri Lankan, uh, one of the Pali colonial text and Samantha Pasadika from another commentary literature from Dijanikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha. It actually Samantha Pasadika well, is not translated into English yet. All are remaining in Sri Lanka language and Pali language. So in this, I mean, I mean, I mean it is very big, big controversy whether Abhidharma was taught by the Buddha or not. But in the third Buddhist council, all the monks agreed that Abhidharma was taught by the Buddha. They say Buddha Vachana or Buddha Vashita. That means words of the Buddha. So we can see that one, one text uh, from uh, Atta Salini, one of the texts from Abhidharma. In this text, it mentioned that Buddha went to heaven to teach his late mother. So as we know that from the historical Buddha's biography, his mother pa passed away just seven days later after he, Prince Siddhartha was born. So it says that she transmitted into heaven. And after Buddha enlightenment, he did not, forgo he did not forget his mom and dad. So he also went to his uh, home to teach his father. And he was reflecting that where is his mother? So he, 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 through his practice, he realized that his mother is now the heaven. So he needs to go heaven. And it says that, it believed that Buddha spent three months into the, in the heaven to teach his uh, mother, who became born as a, one deity in the, into the heaven. So in the heaven, he taught Abhidharma. According to, according to the, one is scripture, uh, Atta Salini, the text name. And the Atta Salini was compiled in, in the third century BCE. 
And another text mentioned after the Buddha enlightenment, when he was reflecting into his practice and his teaching, what it would be like this, and to understanding the, the nature of the mind, he realized uh, he 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 realized the teach he he realized the teaching of Abhidharma. So if you if if you have a chance to go Buddha Gaya, maybe we can see that one place is called the Ratnagar. And this place was uh, was very, very 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 beautifully rearranged. And in this place, Buddha was uh, realized the teaching of Abhidharma. But my question is that my argument, why it was not mentioned into the first and second Buddhist council? Because first Buddhist council, in the in the first Buddhist council, you can see that all of the disciple, those who see the Buddha and who was immediate disciple, they attended. And in the second Buddhist council too, it was not so far, just hundred years later after his passed away. So almost the teaching will be primordial teaching will be there. But anyway, in the third Buddhist council, for the first time, we can see that Abhidharma teachings were recorded. And Abhidharma teachings, uh, we can see that seven texts of Abhidharma. And Abhidharma teaching based on the mind and mental concomitant elements. And uh, also they discuss about the, 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 all the dimensions of the mind and mental factors and also discuss Nirvana too. So in the, in, in, in the third Buddhist council, we can see that for the first time that Abhidharma was there. And the elder monk, Maha, uh, his name is Magali, Tisha, who is a counselor, who is the chairman, chief monk for third Buddhist council. He compiled the Abhidharma text, Kathavatu, points of controversy. The, it is considered as the fifth text of Abhidharma literature. And interestingly, uh, later on, we can see that uh, the seven Abhidharmika texts similar to the Sanskrit literature as well. And Fourth Buddhist Council also talk about this almost the same way, like they agree that Abhidharma literature was, uh, was compiled by the Buddha as well. So at a glance, we can see Third Buddhist Council again we can see that first Buddhist council, just three months later after the Buddha's passed away. And second Buddhist council, you can see, 100 years after the Buddha's passed away. So until the second Buddhist council, we can consider as non-sectarian period because the Sangha was not split in not much way. And in the third Buddhist council, we can see that, uh, you know, we can see that Dharma teaching also them, uh, some later addition too. We can see Dharma, Vinaya and Abhidharma. And after the third Buddhist council, we, the, there's a massive change and Buddhism came to the, under the one, one religious form. And we can see that there are three developments after the third Buddhist council. One development is the relationship between the monastic order and lay people were integrated. So before, until the, uh, we can see that after, during the time of Ashoka and after Third Buddhist Council, Ashoka spawned, uh, supported to build up a lot of monasteries and stupas. Actually, sometimes stupa is considered as the part of the monastery too. So this tradition, stupa and monastery, it was evolved in India. And when the monastery, Monast actually, the monastic tradition was in the Buddha's time too, but in not the same way like Third Buddhist Council it was held. So during that period, Ashokan period, a lot of um, people, they support to the monastic Sangha. And also the relationship, lay people and monastic, it was, uh, it was beautifully developed. And since, as you know that, Monks and nuns, all the Sangha members, they depend on people. They're not, uh, they're not because of their practice and they are spending their time for renunciation. And uh, their, their part is to find out the truth of 
of the life or and cessation of suffering they follow the path of renunciation therefore their lifestyle see not similar to lay life and they're not allowed to work they're not allowed to 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 do the household life like lay people that's why monks the monastic sangha monastic life they are they, they follow the path of renunciation but then it's support then it's support from lay people so during, during the ashoka's period the relationship between the monastic member and the lay people it was increased and most after after third buddhist council because after the council ashoka is supported to build up a lot of monasteries in all over the all over the his regions it is recorded that he built up 84000 stupas according to the ashoka one text written by venerable asogosa in the second century and after the start buddhist council buddhist literature and the scholastic tradition was evolved and since we see that abhidharma tradition was started and abhidharma tradition is is of obviously it is wonderful tradition and it evolved in the scholar more scholar way and this literature extended and provide the insight to understand the mind mental concomitants mental factors and different types of states of different states of the mind and after third buddhist council we also see another thing like archaeological uh, buddhist architectures and rituals were evolved and ritual part uh, it was not actually exactly that we cannot see that uh, from the according to the account according to the scriptures we cannot see from until the second buddhist council but third buddhist council you can see that more ritual stuff and a lot of chanting the tradition of chanting was the start and it says that the, the chanting tradition it was uh, it was uh, represent represent the monastic tradition too and we can see that in this after third buddhist council a footprints of the buddha like uh, some people started to the some monks started to create the footprint and they believe that uh, the buddha's footprint was was marked with the 34 32 characteristics according to the scriptures and they put all the characteristics on the footprint so the tradition of footprints start and the tradition of worshiping to the buddha tree buddha tree as we know that the the tree uh, the tree of the ficus Religiosa, the tree was uh, under the tree. Buddha was enlightenment. So they started to worship the Buddha tree in the Buddha Gaya. The Buddha tree was, uh, you know, it was also well well preserved still now today. And in the Buddha tree, during the time of Emperor Ashoka, that place was uh, was developed and uh, reconstructed. And it says that the diamond throne also reconstructed too during the time of Queen Ashoka. And a lot of Buddhist symbols start like chakra and Ashokan, uh, the, the lion head. And as, as I showed that you can see the chakra, like as it's a wheel of the Dharma, the wheel, the motion, turning the wheel of the Dharma, as we said. And uh, the, the lion head, we can see, lion head is considered as the is the roar, the lion lion roar of the Buddha's teaching. So this kind of tradition start after the third Buddhist council. And this is, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, I took this picture from Vaishali, from uh, Sister Wangmo. Is it correct? Is it from Vaishali, right? I can't hear you. Sorry, I which one the, the uh, one where the first one first one. Yes, yeah. I don't I don't think it is in Vesali. Maybe Shantam can tell us, but I I don't because I don't recall a lake there. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, it is not actually not lake. It is a rainy season. It was, <laughs> oh, okay. It's all the ruins, are, you know. Yeah, yeah, I don't recognize that for Vesali, but maybe. Uh, Shantam, 
I don't know if you're on the on the call, but maybe you can see. Sorry to wait. Sorry to. <laughs> closed off. I'm sorry. Yeah, that that is Vaishali. Yes. Vaishali. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I the, the, the first, the first one with the lake. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Chantel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wake me up again. Okay. <laughs> no, it's just very we late. Have an expert. We have an expert of all the <laughs> sacred sites with us. So yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So then uh, after Thad Buddhist Council, we can say that uh, the tradition of symbol and all the tradition came, uh, but it's still Thad Buddhist Council. We cannot say that any of the statue, st the tradition of a st Buddha, Buddha statue, which was not there actually, but the tradition of Buddha statue, it, it evolved uh, during the time of King Kanishka, Emperor Kanishka. It was later, actually after a few hundred years later, after, you know. So we can say that a lot of capes, and a lot of a lot of um, uh, Buddhist architectures, and it was developed in the time of uh, during, during the time of uh, Emperor Ashoka, and it was wonderful contributions. So then, the that the monks, um, I mean, uh, the monks, they started started to 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 stay in the monastery. I mean, uh, actually, months also before they st stay monastery, but in Thad, after Thad Buddhist Council, it was more systematic order. So then, uh, what happened then after to the to those uh, the false monk, or as you as you mentioned that the heretic monk, heretic monks or titia, those monks they left from Pataliputra at the end of Thad Buddhist Council. And those monks, it says that maybe they went to more Kashmir and Gandhara, those, 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 those uh, states. Uh, but they left from North India, North Indian part. So now we, we, like to, we like to speak about a little bit about Emperor Ashoka. Emperor Ashoka has a very important uh, role, played an important role to propagate uh, Dharma and also important role to, to support, uh, to, to help the Thad Buddhist Council in India. So Emperor Ash Ashoka's life and legacy was, uh, was, was very uh, popular when you start talking about the history of the Buddha Dharma. So Emperor Ashoka, he was, uh, uh, he, he, we, we, can, we, can, we can divide his life in the three periods. So one period we can see that before he converted into Buddhism, we can divide it into two parts, two ways. And another is after he converted into Buddhism. So he was born in the Mohiran dynasty. And, and uh, before he ascended into throne, it says that he, he was a very cruel person. And uh, he killed his own brothers according to the Ashoka Vadana by Venerable Aswagosa, it mentioned he killed his 99 brothers to ascend his throne. Maybe his father have a couple of wives. So they have all half brothers and except his own brother, he killed all of, the, all of his 99 brothers because it was a big kingdom and he would like to be the king. So he was a very cruel person somehow. And after he ascended into the into the Mayuran throne, Ashoka was uh, engaged into the uh, this one war. It was very in history. It was known as very dark war. It is called as Kalinga War. In the Kalinga War, Ashoka killed nearly two hundred thousand people, children and and women as well. So it was very cruel war in the history of Indian. But it was uh, we can we this and then su suddenly, uh, I mean not suddenly like uh, after he converted to Buddhism, he became more uh, more 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 right to a skin and following the Dharma in the you know, and he changed his personalities too. It was quite interesting how Ashoka converted into Dharma. Actually, 
after he after the destruction of Kalinga War, it was actually massive destruction. And in that period, killing about nearly two hundred thousand people, it makes him very 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 painful in his heart, and he could not sleep very well. He even always have a his mind always have repentance. Uh, I mean remorse. And he feel that uh, he has done a very wrong things in his life, and he could not really reflect his mind as a peaceful way. So one day, he he was standing from from his palace, and a young novice monk was walking in front of his palace. So he saw that this novice monk very peaceful and very happy. And he looks very contemplated with the present moment too. So Ashoka said that what is the reason that this novice, the young ascetic, he feel very peaceful and happy. So I like to call him, and I, I need to talk with him. And uh, he called his uh, Ashoka called his uh, people and worker from the royal palace that please call this novice monk. I would like to invite him into my royal palace. And I need to talk to him. And I need to find out the reason why he looks very peaceful and happy. So Ashoka invited him, this novice monk. His name, his name was Nigroda Samaneda. So Nigroda Samaneda, he was very deep, deep practitioner at his young age. He was just seven years old. He did not know much about the teachings, but he was practicing very well. So Ashoka asked Nigroda Samaneda after he entered into the royal palace, he said that, okay, take, you are my guest today. So please sit, take a seat as you, uh, you know, as you, as you convenience place. So Nigroda Samaneda looked here and there, and he just see the throne. And he feel that the throne probably the right place to sit. And the Gruta Samana they immediately walk, you know, uh, elegant way, and he sit on the throne, as, uh, the uh, emperor's throne. And it was very uh, brave decision because sitting on the emperor's throne is not an easy way. It seems emperor was there, and this guy is this. This is just seven years old, not novice. So Emperor Ashoka was uh, surprised, and he said, "This novice is a fearless." Uh, today he is my guest, so he can do whatever, and I am very very happy to serve him. So Ashoka asks him some, what is inside behind it, and what do you what do you practice, and do you have anything to tell me? Nigruda Samaneda just speak the some a few words from so from the mindfulness uh, about mindfulness, which is recorded into Dharmapada. Uh, in Dhammapada, the, sec the, the one chapter is called about mindfulness, Chitta Varga. So Nigruda Samanada said, Apamada Matan Padam, Amadu Machuna Padam. That means, uh, heedfulness is the state of mindfulness. Those who is mindful, he can enter into the state of deathlessness. The deathlessness means you can say that Nirvana, another term for Nirvana. So having listened this kind of word, and Ashoka was so, so, so peaceful, and he said, wow, such a beautiful things, and uh, I'm not mindful. And I killed so many people just for ascending the throne, and it's not behaving very well. And Ashoka ch changed his mind. He felt very calm down, peaceful. And he asked Nigruta Samaneda that, okay, I would like to offer you lunch. And, uh, Ashoka offered lunch, but Nigruta Samanara did not take this lunch. He said that I have to bring this lunch to my teacher. So, and Ashoka asked that, no, I can give the lunch for your teacher as well, but what if this considered to take lunch for here? I said, no, I cannot take lunch without my teacher because I came for arms round for, and the, the, the food we share with our elder months. So Ashoka was very pleased having seen that his uh, devotion to his elder teacher and his take care of, this of, the, of his teacher. So normally another tradition of the monks that monks, uh, as you know, that monk doesn't, uh, according to the ancient discipline by the, by the Buddha's way, monk doesn't cook food at home. I mean, to those who is uh, in, the, in the past, 
they have they have to practice an uh, arms round and with the with the with the with the ball so by arms round they collecting the foods and all the foods they bring back to their monastery so nigruta samanada following this very very accurate way and he following the discipline very very nice way that's why he wants to bring back all the foods to the his teachers and he share that he will eat because all the many of the elder monks they could not go for arms round because of their age some are very old very old so ashoka well, wanted to know about his elder, his teachers, and the monks, and uh, then by by through Nigruda Samanera, Ashoka met uh, the elder Magaliputta Tisha. So who became the chairperson, uh, you know, the, the leader for Thad Buddhist Council? So it was the it was the it was the story about uh, story about the Ashoka how he converted into Dharma, and after he converted into Dharma. Ashoka completely changed his mind, and he became he wants to be like a right was king and Dhamma no Dhamma Raja. There is another concept you can see from Ashoka's is a pillar edict. So he want to become a right was king, and he would like to. He declared that in his kingdom, he is all the monks and brahmana, samana and brahmana, brahmana. Uh, sometimes brahmana is considered as a Hindu religious teacher as well. Or sometimes Brahmana I consider as a wise person or scholars. A Samanara, Samanara, uh, mostly it uh, considered as Buddhist Sangha. So monks and uh, Brahmana or all the religious teachers are well supported. And he declared that religious one department for religious, which is a Dhamma Mantana, or uh, Dhamma Manta, uh, Dhamma Mantata in Pali. Or Dhamma Mantrana in Sanskrit. So in uh, Ashoka, he followed. He he was very generous, and he liked to support the, all the monastic sanghas, and he also built up the a lot of stupas, temples, and uh, he also liked to. He also he also he also helped to reconstruct it all the pilgrimage sites as we can see that in the India, all over the India. And another important scholarship from Ashoka, he recorded the, all the teachings and important places that related to the historical Buddha's journey. And wherever he went, he put the, all, the, all the pillar edict and rock edict too. And all the scriptures, was written in Brahma, Brahma Lipi, or another term for Brahma Lipi is uh, Magadi Prakit. So from the Ashokan scripture and Ashokan pillar edict, we can know that a lot of information about the, about the historical Buddha's journey. And you can see that after the third Buddhist council and during the time of third Buddhist council, what happened and the, and the, and the the political political situation too. So still now we can see in the museum of Pataliputra, not India. We can see a lot of uh, we can see Ashokan Ashokan pillar edict, and you can also see Ashokan pillar edict in uh, in the Nepal, Lumbini, in Delhi. Some are in the Pakistan too, and Bangladesh as well, because Ashoka has a, a very extensive extensive kingdom. And uh, his kingdom, you can see that it was uh, it was covered uh, almost all over the India. I think it's, uh, it's a, um, and he extended it, it was ext it was very very huge land, you know. He, in the in the history of the human civilization, I think two kings are very well well known. One is the Alexander the Great, and another is Ashoka. But interestingly, both the kings are. Same time, but they never meet each other. So, Ashoka was uh, in, in, in his in his extensive state. All over the state, he propagated. Uh, he supported to build up the monasteries, stupas, and he whatever he 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 built up the monastery. He put the rock edict and pillar edict too. And from the interestingly, from the Ashokan scripture. We also can see that a lot of moral words. 
and one is some some uh, we can see that the, the, the term for lay, lay disciple for, for lay followers of the dharma about the five precepts so we can see that this kind of uh, this structure and this rules from ashokan pillar pillar edict and he said that in my kingdom everybody should follow the five precepts and ashoka was uh, very strict to 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 following the dharma and he did not allow to kill any animals. So in, this in his territory, uh, animals like a happy life of freedom and not no one allowed to kill animals. And interestingly, another thing you can see, Ashoka did not only make the, some hospital for, for many people, in his turn, he also, he also had a special treatment department to support uh, animals. And Bart. So he was a very, very kind king after he converted into Buddhism. And after Third Buddhist Council, the another important thing is that it's very important. And uh, Ashoka support the Sangha to go beyond the India. I mean, from um, I mean more further from the India. So he sent nine missionaries into nine different regions. Interestingly, Ashoka's time, one group of, one group of missionary sent to Greek. And Dharma came to the West, I, you can say, from the, during the time of uh, King Ashoka. So, and also during, during his time, also one group went to Sri Lanka. And before this, Sri Lanka could not uh, familiar with the teaching of the, of the Buddha. So Ashoka sent his uh, son and daughter who became monk and nun in, later on. So into Sri Lanka under his project of Dharma missionaries. And another group of monks also went to Egypt in Africa too. So it's, you can say that in the Ashoka's time, maybe it was the first time Dharma go, went uh, beyond the Asian continent. And of course, the all over Deshi also, he also propagated, he sent the, the, this is missionary Sangha. And uh, in, in his time, Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, and this, this zone, the, the, the Southeast Asia, or on the East Asia also introduced with, to the teaching of Dharma. So as we can say that uh, after Third Buddhist Council, the real propagation, propagation of Dharma start and it went beyond from, beyond from India. So this, it is a very uh, important council the third, uh, as, as we can we can see that uh, we can see, we, we, we can go to that a, a little bit behind again. So in the first Buddhist council and second Buddhist council, we did not see that missionaries, uh, dharma um, propagation beyond the from the from the North India, but after third Buddhist council, if we compare and contrast, we can see that dharma went to beyond uh, North India. So it has started it, it, not only not India, not, not only the all over the India, the missionaries went in Africa, Europe, and the Southeast Asia as well. So it takes it took time to 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 propagate uh, to propagate the to to, to, in, to introduce the Buddhism by by others. But mostly the Third Buddhist Council, uh, and after after met the Third Buddhist Council, we can see that uh, Buddhism was entering into a religious format, and into religious to according to the definition of religious, we can we can see that it included about the rites and rituals, and uh, the systematic order, and a group and symbols and all the things you can see, worshipings, uh, we can see this, this, this kind of uh, traditions 
start. So we uh, for 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 knowing the knowing the scriptures, we are also very grateful to Emperor Ashok and his contribution because he has a, the vision to propagate, to, en to envoy the teachings beyond from India so that the people from Sri Lanka or people from Southeast Asia or even the Greece and uh, in Africa as well, they are familiar with this peaceful, uh, the teaching of the, of the Buddha. And uh, Ashoka was uh, shared with them how peaceful he was after he converted into the into the dharma and every time he sent his missionary he also sent uh, with a letter and in his letter royal letter he mentioned that he's about his most peacefulness and he gave his title he said a devanam priyatisha that means he is beloved by gods and deities devanam priyatisha because he is uh, he is uh, following the dharma and uh, he is very peaceful and his kingdom is peaceful and he stopped to war to, to, to contribute to any war. So it was, uh, we, we can see that after Ashokan period, the, mostly the Dharma was, uh, I mean, the Buddhism was uh, introduced outside of the North India. So, uh, so it will be nice that now, now maybe that we can do some discussion as well. So regarding the, regarding the the Swiss context. So if any of you have any inquiry, it will be wonderful. Did it go anywhere near Tibet? Uh, well, um, in the Ashoka's period, actually, one group went to Himalaya region. They did not mention Tibet. So Tibet is the Himalaya region. So you can say Arunachal and uh, ne Bhutan, Nepal. So it can be it can be possible. Well, maybe that group went to Tibet probably because two monks uh, two monks went to the Himalaya region and it mentioned the nine missionary. It mentioned the Himavanta or Himalaya regions. But we exactly don't know that those monks entered into Tibet or not. But they say that near to the Himalaya, Nepal. Uh, I mean that uh, Bhutan and uh, Arunachal and near to Tibet, yeah. So maybe close, huh? Maybe close, yeah. Probably it can be possible. So how about China then? How did it? Uh... China, China actually, um, yeah, it's a good question. China got uh, Dharma in the time of uh, over the Silk Road in during the time of King Emperor Kanishka. So we don't know actually, it can be possible because the term, the Ashoka sent uh, one missionary in the Shubana Bhumi. So Shubana Bhumi is considered as present day Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Java, or Sumatra or Indonesia, this zone. So during that time, this territory was belonged to Chinese emperor, Chinese Ming dynasty. So since this, the zone of Shubana Bhumi uh, it was belong to Chinese territory, maybe it's possible. But we did not know exact account that whether Dharma entered in that time into China, mainland China or not. But we know that mainland China Dharma was uh, introduced by, uh, you know, in the, 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 the some scholars in the, by, during the time of Emperor Kanishka. Because one thing you have to understand that China have a different uh, language. So classical Chinese and Chinese language was not same to the Sanskrit or Indian language. So that's why we, we maybe not, don't know, but we know that after when the translation, the China got translation about Indian scriptures, and we know that from that time period that it came from about mostly second century or first century in that period. But we did not know about, you know, Ashoka's time, whether China got this uh, teaching or not. Thank you. Uh, is there anything that we can share? And this, this we are ask them. Um... With uh, in terms of the differences uh, of all the uh, the sect uh, in different countries, 
um, the you know the, the basic four noble truth and the eightfold path and most of those are agreed. Where are the differences then uh, in terms of uh, um, with this uh, parsing, I guess? Yeah. Uh, at uh, what point uh, became different for different parts of the, the, the world? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually uh, question. Actually, sir, it's actually to answering this question. I need many years actually. Okay. <laughs> entire entire set of the entire, entire set of the Buddhism actually is a yeah. It is, it is a, but according to my according to my experience or my understanding, the the mainstream the pillar of this teaching are same. The ground, the pillar. So all the all the traditions, whether you go. Theravada traditions or Chinese traditions or Tibetan tradition, all the traditions they agree the term four noble truths. They, have? they, they mm -hmm. agree the term eightful noble path. Mm -hmm. And they all agree the samatha and vipassana meditation, the insight meditation and the meditation of concentration. And they agree the term of compassion. Mm -hmm. And they agree basic the rules, binaya, the all the disciplines. But yeah, but uh, the the difference tradition starts actually based on the Abhidharma literature when it is evolved. Some tradition they agree with Abhidharma, and some tradition they did not agree with Abhidharma. Mm -hmm. Like for example, like you can see that uh, Stavidavada and Maha, Mahasangika after Second Buddhist Council, but many many school in in Stavidavada they did not they did not agree with Abhidharma tradition. For example, like Southern Chika, they they did not. They, they said no. We are only emphasizing the sutranta part. But you can see that the branch, they are part of the Vivajavada, or they are part of the Stavidavada, or they are part of the Theravada too. Actually, the Theravada. Now we, we don't say the term Vivajavada or Stavidavada. Now we see the term only Theravada. Theravada. We can see that the country Sri Lanka, Thailand, India, Bangladesh, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar. They follow the Theravada tradition. So the Theravada is later on tradition of Vivajavada or Stavidavada. But, but uh, yes, uh, at the moment, actually, Theravada tradition, they agree, they accept Abhidharma. But in the past, a few schools, they don't agree with Abhidharma. So based on, we can say that, based on the Abhid Abhidharma agreement and disagreement with Abhidharma literature or tradition, maybe Dharma was, uh, you know, the many, many schooler, many schooler evolved. But interestingly, all the tradition, all the school monk, they lived together. It was in, in ancient India, no matter that they follow the Sarvastivada or Kashapiya or, you know, South Chika, they, they lived in the one temple. It was fascinating uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the Buddhist group. And uh, it's revealed that they have uh, some harmonious way. They practice the compassion and loving kindness. Therefore, even they disagree, with the, the doctrinal aspect for some, some point, but they have agreement to live in together in harmonious way. So most of the thing that uh, we can say that Abhidharma tradition later on, it can be uh, make a more uh, sectarian. And as we know that the uh, second century, when Nagarjuna evolved, uh, Nagarjuna started his teaching. Nagarjuna was one of the very famous philosopher and he lived in the 150 to 250 during that period in the second century. So he refuted, he refuted Abhidharma tradition. And he used the term uh, sunyata or emptiness to refuting the viewpoint of, 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 of other school. He said that sunyatam tam prachak mahe, sometimes he used this term. He said, Sarva Drushti Prahadanam, Sinya Tantan Prachat Mahe. So he used, that means that I use the term emptiness to elimination of all the views. Mm. And sometimes he mentioned all the elimination of all the views, like sometimes he, it mentioned like Abhidharmika views too, sometimes. So it is, uh, it is a big contradiction, big, big, uh, big uh, debate whether that what is the right and what is wrong to, 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 to judge from me. So one of my professor, uh, actually, he has been uh, teaching Buddhism for nearly 70 years, actually. Now he is uh, 90 years old. So I, I was fortunate to attend his classes for, few, for, for, for five years. So after 
and my 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 my, my con during our final day of learning with him and we asked one question we said that professor we know that in the mainstream among the 18 schools the four school like uh, Salvastivada, Sautantrika, Madhamika, or Vishyanabada, or Yugachara. There was some doctrinal difference between each, each, each school. But can you tell us who is, what is, who is right and who is wrong? So Professor answered very nice way. He said that I never see anything wrong from any different school. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. It's, I don't know actually, but but yeah, it's very interesting to e explore all this text and it's, it's being a big scholasticism. And Buddhist literature is considered as one of the extensive literature uh, regarding the history of the world history, world religion as well. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so, so maybe that, that, that in, at this point that uh, maybe we, uh, we I understand that all of you are clear until third, third Buddhist Council, isn't it? <laughs> so um, yes, the so third Buddhist Council it was a, it was a very great contribution. And after after third Buddhist Council, we can see that systematic order, and we are very grateful that uh, Ashoka has done a one good job. He recorded. All this, all the, all the teachings onto the on the pillar and pillar edict, you know. And even though it's still now, if sometime we can find the, some of the pillar edict, and we can see that the historical Buddha's uh, teachings and journey and some recorded of the time frame. And and now, in in the you know, after the third Buddhist council, we don't know exactly that what happened in India. You know, uh, exactly the, in the north part of India, because the history, but well, all the teachings, you know, all the records are disappeared. But we know some uh, some uh, the, all the all the teachings in all all the historical histo historical record from Sri Lankan account about Third Buddhist Council, because Sri Lanka received the Buddhism from the after, uh, after the Third Buddhist Council. And they preserved the, all the teachings from that time to until now. But in India, there, yes, please. Um, sorry, Sanjoy, yeah. I just, I had a question here about how, um, um, what are the elements that encourage a council to come together? Um, because as I understand it from the monks, there are certain things that need to kind of be in place for a council to be called, do you did you come across that in your in your research as to what makes a council, um, you know, the calling of the council by the sangha? Because um, as you go forward in your history, we've come to the sixth council, and some have been talking about the seventh council maybe happening in India. So I'm just wondering if in your research. There's something that talks about how the council, the the need for council to come together. Uh, well, yes, uh, I already mentioned uh, in, the, in the in the in the research. Actually, the main reason was division of sangha. Every council held, and be, 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 before before the council, there's some political problem and the division. Mostly the division, like after Buddha's passed away, what happened? Immediately, some monks started to say that we want to follow the Buddha's rules. And some said, no, we don't want to follow his rules anymore. We can make our own rules. So having observed this incident, Elder, Elder Sangha, they decided that, no, now we have to time for being the, all the teachings come together. We need to make a council. So it was the historical background behind the first Buddhist council. And it was just happened three months later after he passed away, just three months. So we can see, and he, Buddha was taught for 45 years and he has many followers and many disciples too. But what happened, nothing happened. Uh, I, mean, I mean, nothing many things happened during his lifetime. Of course, his lifetime, there's some incident happened, such as like Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin brother. He liked to make his own Sangha, own groups. 
So this guy, he studied the Sangha, the monastic members, but Buddha handled it very strongly. He said that, no, you are abandoned from, from this group because you are destroying the peaceful environment of the Sangha and you are making some kind of the system like which, which, which doesn't represent the proper way to follow the Dharma. So the division of Sangha is, is lead to, it was, uh, it was lead to help the first Buddhist council. And in the second Buddhist council happened 100 years later. But the reason was that the most of monks that did not follow the rules proper way. There are so many manipulation, so many misteachings. Uh, I mean, so many, so many, so many wrong idea evolved. Such as in the second Buddhist council, some monks uh, they are accepting to 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 to, to preserve the gold, to preserve the money. I mean, gold. I mean, gold is the medium for money in that time. Gold and uh, bronze, silver. So. And also they preserve the food in a certain point. So those kind of things, they could not support the concept of renunciation. So since monks are renounced or renunciation, the path of renunciation, they renounce their household life. But even as a monk, if they do the, if they act how, like a household life, so it's not a part of renunciation. So as uh, in an ancient tradition, the monk, since People know that monks are not support, are not doing the household life, or they not have a normal life like a household people. They are supported by local community. So some monks they became into the order to receive support. So it was not proper intention, proper right way. So it is it's, it's a conflict between the renunciation part. So this is the reason for Second Buddhist Council. So this is in the same way Third Buddhist Council was held, the same reason. But um, Fourth Buddhist Council, we actually exactly don't know actually what the reason, but we know a little bit about the Fourth Buddhist Council. But Fifth Buddhist Council and Sixth Buddhist Council, we know that it was, it was held in uh, Myanmar. Uh, but I, I, I agree with you that uh, there are so many council, maybe small council or big council, but we don't know exactly. Maybe, maybe the other, uh, you know, there's so many, I, I suppose to be many council too. Like present day, we have a, we arrange a, every year, we arrange a numbers of conference. And if, at the end of every conference, we try to agree that some teachings are, you know, and we like to produce many books, many reprinting all the books. It is also part of re, uh, preservation. So, but one good thing is that after each, few, at the end of each council, the teaching are compiled in systematic order. So <clears throat> like after first Buddhist council, you can see that Dharma and Vinaya was recorded. But Dharma Vinaya, it was recorded in oral transmission, which is such a very big job and very hard to do. As we discussed last class, Banaka tradition, like the Dharma was transcript and transmitted by, recorded by oral, by generation by generation. It's about 300 years. So they have a very big job to do doing it. And Second Buddhist Council also as well, Dharma and Vinaya was compiled. And Third Buddhist Council, we came, we came to know that about uh, written scripture and people have started to use the palm leaf. And uh, during that time in the, within the palm leaf scripture, people like to uh, record it, all the teachings, what happened. And Dharma, Vinaya and Abhidharma. So, and also Fourth Buddhist Council also have seen that they the, the, the recorded Abhidharma literatures too, but in Sarvastivada tradition, we never see that Stavidavada or Bivajavada in the Fourth Council. So, but there is one, one uh, we, maybe we can talk a little bit about the Fourth Buddhist Council today. It says that Fourth Buddhist Council, there's a four, two Fourth Buddhist Council. One was held in Kashmir, in the first century. At the same time, another council held in Sri Lanka. So, but in the uh, Tarawada account, they disagree. They say that no, the fourth Buddhist council should be the Sri Lanka. But on the other hand, the Indian accounts, uh, they say that uh, also Chinese account, Chinese reference, 
they agreed that Fourth Buddhist Council was held in Kashmir. And Sarvastivada traditions and all the Abhidharma literature from Sarvastivada uh, was recorded. Actually, Sarvastivada, the term, it was one of the sister school of Theravada. Both school, they agree with the Abhidharma literatures. But at the moment, we, we know very much only Theravada. We don't see Sarvastivada very at all uh, widely in the Southeast Asia. We can see Sarvastivada tradition in Tibet. We can see into the China as well, in, because Chinese, they recorded all the teachings in classical Chinese language. Uh, they translated from Sanskrit to Sanskrit, Sanskrit language to Ch Chinese language from second century to until ninth century during that period. So, yeah. But, but, but the reason is that uh, the division of Sangha and they unified to bring together all the Sangha together and make them agreement that these are the teachings from the Buddha and we are going to follow this path. Maybe this is the, this is the, this is the reason that all the council held and the output of the good output for the, for the, for the council to, but most of the thing we can see that the, the reason for the council, the division of the Sangha, the division of the community. So, yeah, so. Thank you so much, Sanjoy. Yeah, you're welcome. So is there any more, I think, yeah, our time is up. <laughs> so is there any, any, any question that I can be help? Well, so, so that means that- Actually, uh, you know, the, the um, the Buddha, in terms of uh, his hand touching the ground, um, that particular symbol, uh, since all the sim symbol you, you mentioned came after uh, the, the the third council. Right, right, right. right. So that um, image of the Buddha, his hand touching the ground, and a lot of the um, uh, information were, was dependent on that particular uh, gesture. Uh, who decided that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, Im image of the ground is called the Bhumi Spasha Buddha. We can see the in the Buddha in the, in the Buddha Gaya as well. So now, who is not the who decided this? Well, actually, this kind of uh, structure was written in the uh, in the scripture, like uh, in the Udana, in the text of Udana. Uh, we can see that the Buddha touched the ground, the touched the earth, and he claimed that. I fulfill all of my parameters. I accumulated all of my, you know, uh, all of my merits, and I have, I have, con I have many lives. I was in this earth, and I, 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 I endured, and I followed the Bodhisattva path, and I determined with my practice. So it is called Bhumi Spasha Buddha. It was written in the scripture. Okay. I, I, I found in Udana Gata. Udana is a, one of the texts from Kuddha Kanikaya. I, if I'm not wrong, it is the number 12 text because Kuddha Nikaya have 15 text. So it is 11 or 12, 12, I think it's 12, if I'm not wrong, 12 text of, uh, of Kuddha Nikaya. And Bhumi Sparsha that touched the ground, this the structure of the statue, it came from, um, it started evolved during the time of Emperor Kanishka or Kushan, and Kushan dynasty from the second century to the fourth century. The tradition of statue evolved. So actually the tradition of a statue it came from India did not know how to create a statue during that period. India learned the tradition of creating a statue from Greek. Because mm -hmm. through the Silk Road, Greek and India they have a business and they are uh, exchange their literature, they exchange their culture. Mm -hmm. And when Indian people went to Greece and they saw the, they saw the, this statue, all the, all the, all the uh, Olympus and uh, all the Greek deities, all the statue there. And then when the, after they returned to their home ground, they said, why not? We don't, we don't create a statue for our historical figure. So from that time, Buddhist statue was came, the, the culture and the Hindus, Hindu also, they do the same job too. So, it was, uh, it became more popular and they make the, they, they create the stone, they cut the stone and to, by, by, by st 
the create a sculpture by, by cutting the, all the stones. And India had a lot of stones during that period. So yeah, but, but, but those uh, statues have uh, some historical background. So every statue you can see based on the historical Buddha's, uh, some of the life, some of his life, uh, life story. Some touching the ground just before his was enlightenment. Some statue you can see that uh, the hand is like this. It's called a fearless, uh, fearless mudra. Like I, I, I said, refusing the triple gem, it offers you the fearless. But uh, according to the scripture, we say that those who is the fearless, he always follow the path, and he had, those who follow the morality and who has an ethical discipline, he is a fearless. So Buddha is a fearless because he followed the path. So that's why to, 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 to represent, this, uh, represent this idea, so they start a fearless statue of the Buddha. So it came uh, nearly 800 later, 800 years later after the Buddha's passing away, the tradition of a statue, came, this statue came. But Buddhist symbol came 300 years later, like Emperor Ashoka's time, mostly you know, during, the, during, during his time. So, so before I, I, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so before I end up, if I understand that, if any any more uh, question that I can pick up, then it's all right. So okay, so uh, since <laughs> since no more questions, so that I understand that all of you understand that first Chi Buddhist councils. Okay, thank you so much. So thank, thank you very much. Uh, I wish all of you have a wonderful weekend. And, uh, and uh, so before we finish that, uh, maybe we can share the, our merits uh, according to tradition of uh, in the Southeast Asia, we, we do this way. So thank you all. Bhava to sabba mangala nga kanto sabba devata sabba buddhanu bhavena sada sutte bhavantu te Bhava to Sabha Mangalang Rakanto Sabha Devata Sabha Dharmanu Bhavena Sada Sutti Bhavantu Te Bhava to Sabha Mangalang Rakanto Sabha Devata Sabha Sanganu Bhavena Sada Sutti Bhavantu Te Thank you all. See you next week. Bye. Stop. Stop sharing. <laughs>